Okay, we will uh, call to order this public meeting for April 9th, 2020. I want to say straight away, though, that I am going to have to skip out at 3 o'clock. So uh, my two comrades in arms here, uh, Dave and Juanita, will carry on just fine without me. So before we dive in, we need to acknowledge that all, pretty much every one of us who are sitting in on this call are sitting on the ancestral homeland of the Salish and Kalispell people. With that, we should slip right to the Pledge of Allegiance. And I believe Emmy has a flag, a flag queued up for us. Is that correct? Her mic is off, but mm -hmm. I don't, it was going to show up. Oh, here we go. Look at that. Okay, please join me. Ready? Here we go. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I think that I think the camera just caught my torso when I Didn't stood up. I'll need to <laughs> adjust this in the future. <laughs> I did a little midriff thing. I hope my piercing did stick out. My apologies. <laughs> okay, any public announcements? I did have one noted that uh, the census is on, and anyone who is out there who's received a notice. <laughs> follow accordingly. If you didn't, you can get online. You can uh, fill up the census online easily. You don't have to mess with any other humans. So please do that. So, hello, everyone. This is um, Jerry Ducey. I am a partnership specialist with the U.S. Census Bureau, and I work closely with your county and city and um, lots of partners to um, ensure a complete count in Missoula County. And I am a double graduate of U of M, so go Grizz. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I wanted to just, just start out today by saying um, Missoula is off to, Missoula County is off to a great start um, with the census in spite of all of the distractions and um, reformatting of things as COVID-19 has progressed. So we started with um, the census being available online and by phone. Um, back in the, like the 20, 21st of March. And right now, um, the U.S. in general, as a, about 46% have self-responded. Montana itself is a little lower at 38.7%. Missoula County is at 48.2%. And Missoula City proper is at 53%. So um, that is really, really good news. Um, a couple of important things to update about the census, especially as it relates to Missoula, is um, there's been kind of a complete restructuring of how we're doing uh, university counts. And so I want to assure you that we have a good plan in place to capture all of the students that live on campus. And that's gonna be done through administrative records largely. Uh, and the place that we're going to need a lot of help and we're working closely with the university and partners is to make sure that those um, students who lived off campus in apartments and other things like that, that they still count themselves in Missoula and not where they ended up going home to um, as the campus closed down. So that um, is kind of an ongoing uh, work that we are uh, making sure to uh, do everything we can to make that possible. So I will keep you updated on that front. In other uh, topics, um, one of the reasons Missoula is doing so well is because most people have received their packets in the mail. And as I said, Montana in general is lower than that because some counties um, really all get their mail by post office box or like rural route delivery. And due to COVID-19, those operations where they go out and leave the packet on the door of those households um, only lasted for two days before it got shut down. So 
where you see really low counts and response rates in Montana, it's largely because they haven't gotten anything. Uh, so I, I think that's important to note, but Missoula County doesn't have a lot of that update, that process called update leave. So most people have been notified and are responding quite well. I mean, higher than the national average. So that's good, but we can't um, take our foot off the gas here. We have to really keep going. And right now it's been extended by, by two weeks um, into August and that may be delayed farther. We just have to wait and see um, when it's safe to start doing those field operations again. So until further, I, we're, we're estimated to start again in the, in the beginning of May with those field operations, but um, that of course just depends on what's going on at the national level, the state level, and even county by county across Montana. So it is easy to self-respond. Just go to 2020census.gov and you can find a phone number to call. You can um, take it online. Even if you haven't been invited to participate, right below where you would put in your code that you got in the mail. If you haven't gotten something in the mail, you can click right below that where it says, I don't have a code. It just asks you a couple of extra questions and then it can, um, the system can back it up on the back end and attach you with your household code if you don't have it. So I encourage all of you to get online and take the census, um, challenge your friends and neighbors. Uh, there's just really nothing more important to um, financially and to planning purposes and all of those things for Missoula County. Does anybody have any questions for me? Thanks for your work. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, I didn't get on video today because I have dogs and kids at home and you just never know what might happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do we have any uh, public comment on items not on the agenda? Okay, seeing none, I can report to you of our current claims as of March 18th and through April 2nd, 2020, to the Board of County Commissioners. We have claims out for $2,272,381.68. We have five public hearings today. Our first one concerns a city county interlocal agreement for the administration of 2018 open space bond proceeds and our very own Juniper Davis of Caps and Parks, Trails and Open Lands will offer us a presentation. Hi, good afternoon. Um, let me just get up and running here. Can you all hear me? Yes. Can you see yes. me? Perfect, great. Well, it's nice to see you all, um, even in light of the present context, but I'm pleased to be here today to present to you uh, this final draft of the 2018 Open Space Bond Interlocal. Um, here for your presentation and your consideration is the approval of that interlocal. So this interlocal agreement is between the city of Missoula and Missoula County, and it will govern the use of the open space bond proceeds, and it will also set forth the limitations and procedures for use of those funds. So since the passage of our old bond, the 2006 bond, which was a $10 million bond, um, Missoula County has seen over 30,000 acres of permanent conservation in this area. Um, we're really pleased with the, with the result of that 2006 bond. Um, for every open space dollar of that bond that was spent in the county, it was matched with um, nearly $3 in other funds, and we saw great success with that. Um, Building on that success in June, uh, June 25th of 2018, the city supported putting the open space bond on the 2018 ballot. And then on July 9th, the Board of County Commissioners approved the resolution to do that. So then on November 6th, 63% of Missoula County voters did vote in favor of this 20, 2018 open space bond in the amount of $15 million. 
Um, the language of the approved ballot allows for the bond proceeds to be spent on the costs of conserving, enjoying, and enhancing open space lands. So this includes a number of activities. It includes providing public access to water and land, conserving agricultural lands, conserving fish and wildlife habitat and rivers, lakes, and streams, protecting scenic views, and making improvements to lands that are designated as open space. So I wanna draw your attention briefly to just a couple of important aspects of this interlocal agreement. So first, because the open space bond was passed as a county bond by the voters, all project funding must be approved by the county commissioners. So this includes projects that are advanced by the city. So this interlocal really lays out the administrative process for approving open space bond projects brought forward by the city and the procedures by which the city can get reimbursement for project costs. The interlocal specifies that city staff, advisory boards, and leadership will make open space project prioritizations and bring forward proposed projects for up to one half of the 15 million open space bond. And likewise, county staff and advisory boards will undertake prioritization and will propose projects for the other half of the $15 million. All proposed projects will receive a final concurrence or approval from the Board of County Commissioners. Um, I'm gonna pull up a map really quickly, so just bear with me as I shift and share my screen. Um, I believe, I believe this should do it. Are you all seeing the slide? Yeah, nice round bail. Perfect, great. So this first slide. Um, the interlocal agreement also indicates that the city will be responsible for applying its open space funding to the larger Missoula urban area, or as we call it, the Missoula planning region. This is an area that's depicted in this map. It extends outside of the city limits, east to Bonner, south past Miller Creek, and west just beyond the Y. The second slide represents the geographic region. Uh, well, it represents the entire county, but you can see in here that it identifies the rural planning regions and Missoula County will be responsible for applying its one half of the bond proceeds to those rural planning regions outside of Missoula County. I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, I believe. Bear with me for one moment. Okay, are we back and running? We are. Okay, great. Um, so in addition to those, those items, I wanna draw your attention to one final thing in the interlocal, and that is that it requires that open space bond funds can only be spent on lands that are declared open space as defined by Montana state law. This designation will provide lasting assurances that the land will not be converted or diverted from open space well into the future. Um, that pretty much covers the overview of the important aspects of the interlocal that I wanted to make sure we covered. Now we'll just focus our attention really quickly on your consideration of the approval of the interlocal agreement. City and county staff have been working for many months on this draft. Um, we really have appreciated the city's partnership in this work as it has taken us a few months to get through all of the reviews. We have looped in the appropriate city and county attorney's office and our bond council to ensure that the legal language of the interlocal is all appropriate. The Missoula County Open Lands Citizen Advisory Committee submitted comments on the draft interlocal this past fall. And those comments were attached to this agenda item as well as the Board of County Commissioners response. On March 19, on March 9, 2020, the Missoula uh, City Council unanimously approved the final interlocal agreement as part of their consent agenda at their regularly scheduled City Council meeting. So now today we ask that you all, the board, consider approval of the interlocal agreement between the City of Missoula and Missoula County for the administration of 2018 open space bond proceeds. Thanks a lot. Do we have any questions from the public? If, if I may, this is this is Grant. 
uh, open space program manager from the city. Um, I just wanted to express on behalf of the city um, our gratitude for all the folks, um, you know, Juniper, Kylie, all the folks at PTOL, um, the county commission, all the, the county legal staff for moving the needle forward and working with us to, you know, kind of brainstorm and problem solve as we've navigated this kind of long, tedious process. So thank you, guys. Thank you, Grant. Anyone else like to speak to this? Please do. All right, I just had one question I want to ask John Hart about, about the, uh, the act of declaring land open space. Could you elaborate on that a little bit, John? Sure, Commissioner. Uh, the Open Space Act, and I apologize, I can't think of the full name of the act, requires that in these circumstances when, when um, the taxpayers um, tax themselves and use the money to purchase open space, that there be a designation in place on that land um, so that, uh, you know, so that it's not some sort of a transient proposition. And um, th this interlocal has in place a mechanism where the lands, before money is spent on it, any of the lands, the lands will be designated uh, as open space. There's, it, it may not be designated through fee title purchase, um, but it will be, um, there, there will be in place um, protections on the land that is, uh, that the money is used for that will ensure that um, the land remains open and uh, available to the public uh, for as long as you and I are alive, Josh. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Does so, that so, answer your question? Yeah, thanks. So, so John, in essence, it's uh, an encumbrance upon the land uh, akin to a deed restriction of some sort? I don't want to say that it is it's always going to have the the restrictions of a deed restriction dave but there there will be some sort of a um there definitely will be recorded um how do i want to say this there will be uh, restrictions on the land sufficient to satisfy the letter and spirit of the law, those restrictions will be recorded and um, the public know, can know that their, their open space bond funds are being not used for a transient purpose. Is, John, is that declaration something that either our board or the city council and the mayor have to do? No, that's something that the, the, the property owner has to um, do. So if, you know, okay. if it's city owned land, then it's then it's a it's a designation that the city would have to make. If it's county owned land, the county would do it. But then if it's um, if it's, you know, property that's going to remain in private hands, um, but but it's appropriate for bond funds, then the private landowner would be okay. the one that places those restrictions on the land that's helpful and then Juniper, I just, maybe Juniper, I'm, am i answering these questions sufficiently this is great it's great it's perfect yep okay okay <laughs> yeah. and Juniper, you, our bond council our bond council was a was um a little more involved in the nuances mm -hmm. of this process than i was but i was looped in to the extent that uh that there's that we're, we're we're going forward with an interlocal uh, that will designate land in a way that complies with the Open Space Act. That I can tell you we've done. Great, thanks. And I just wanted to double check again, Juniper, with the the designation of open space. Um, it doesn't require public access. Like you could be a private landowner and have a conservation <laughs> on your place that doesn't allow for public access. 
and it would still be eligible for open space bond. That is absolutely correct. You're right. So um, to be eligible for open space bond funds, like in the example of a conservation easement, um, the underlying landowner does not need to provide those lands as um, available to the public. Um, you didn't ask this question, but I'll just add in one more little caveat. Um, the 2018 open space bond uh, funds can be used to do improvements on open space land as well. Our 2006 bond didn't have that language, so this is kind of a new a new era a little bit where we can explore what it might look like to do improvements on land that are designated as open space. And the bond language does require that when you do an improvement project, the improvement project should needs to be open to the public. Um, okay. So there is that, that requirement only to one kind of narrow aspect of the funding. So you wouldn't be able to do um, solely an improvement project on private lands that's not open to the public, but you could do an improvement project on other lands, whether privately held or publicly held, so long as public access is provided. Okay. Thanks for that <laughs> clarification. Yeah, a yeah. reminder. Yeah, <laughs> it's tricky. Uh, yeah. Yeah. One one last question for Juniper. So, could you just briefly recap the the highlights of the changes in process by which um, uh, an open space bond project, 2018 open space bond project would be approved because uh, my understanding is that some of the, at least was the goal to re remove some of the redundancy that we were seeing in terms of meetings and uh, dragging in some of the same mm -hmm. participants for multiple uh, instances. Yeah, you're right. And thank you for drawing that out um, so that we could talk about it. Uh, in 2006, when the open space bond program was developed, it was new and we felt that there needed to be um, quite a bit of process put in place to make sure that we were appropriately looping in the public, creating the right transparency, doing the most due diligence that we possibly could do. We just wanted to make sure we we're doing the program right. We've been running it now um, since 2006 to great success. Um, the pieces that we have put in place around having advisory board um, input both on the city's end and the county's end, staff involvement and then leadership involvement has just proven to be a really great model. Um, we did find though looking back on it that it was a little bit duplicative as you mentioned Dave at times um, some of the process we've created um, was not as needed uh, now that we have a nice kind of steady uh, a program to run these projects through. So we did simplify a couple of small little steps that I don't even think most people would notice. You mostly kind of notice them on the, if you're on the inside of these projects. Um, everything remains the same in terms of public involvement and inclusion and advisory boards and um, the leadership's role in improving and concurring with different project proposals. The differences you'll see were only in some like the number of staff presentations that will need to be made to the county commissioners um, and other kind of smaller moment check-ins. We've kind of um, crossed those off the list, but have maintained all of the main um, opportunities, again, that include public involvement, advisory board involvement, um, you know, staff review and leadership uh, approvals and concurrences. So we feel we feel really pretty strongly that we still have a really robust uh, review process in place. Um, might just be a little bit easier on staff in the end of the day to, to shepherd these through. Great, thanks. Yeah. All right. Are we ready for motion? I'll, I'll make a motion. I'm really excited to protect some habitat and wildlife connectivity and agricultural soils and um, yeah, uh, <laughs> clean air and clean water. So I approve or I motion to um, that we signed the city county interlocal agreement. Or Sorry. actually, yeah, I, I don't have the correct language in front of me. So I, if that's, am I supposed to be reading specific language, Emmy? <laughs> or John. Or John. Okay, well, I motion to approve the city county uh, interlocal agreement for administration of the 2018 open space bond proceeds. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Well done. Thank you so much for bringing this to the room and for all the work you and your staff put in on this.
Thank you. And yeah, thank you to you all. Um, and thank you to Kylie, Paul, um, P2L staff who also helped considerably and Grant Carlton who chimed in there too and our partners with the city. It's a lot of work, but uh, we're, glad to be, we're glad to be in the next era where we actually get to do the prioritization and get the projects on the ground. So it's going to be an exciting next decade of conservation in Missoula County. Yay. Yay. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Okay, our next public hearing uh, is about the Graves Creek Road Petition and Sam Scott, the Real Property Coordinator at the Clerk and Recorder's Office, is here to chat with us. Yeah, all right, thank you. Um, thank you. Let me share my screen real quick. How are you doing, Sam? Yeah, how's your leg? Yeah, are you healed up? Um, getting there, getting there, it's still going, but... Yeah, getting there. Um, sorry. I, There's Graves Creek. There's Graves Creek. <laughs> it always looks like that. <laughs> we'll go on that tour, yeah. I think we're going. <laughs> it looks like Scotland. I wonder where that is. It's a good question. All right. Can everybody see the property information system there? No. Uh, no, uh, not yet. Still looking at an emerald isle. Hi, Sam. If you choose the window that has the specific property information center on it, it should should uh, work. So it's got to. There we go. It's still just showing us the background to see. Oh, there you go. Okay. All right. If that's not working, then I think I might just go without. It's just a property information system. It's not, I don't believe anything we have to have um, if it's still not showing up. Com commissioners, this is Steve Nide. I can share my screen and uh, hopefully you will be able to see what Sam yeah. is attempting to show you. Yeah, that would work well, Steve. Sorry about that. No worries. Perfect. There it is. All right. Um, so the clerk and recorder has received a petition to alter the right of way known as Graves Creek Road, located in Section 20, Township 12, North, Range 22 West, beginning at Montana State Highway 12, ending at the east-west midsection line of Section 20. The petition is to relocate the GLO and 1902 Petition Road to the physical location known as Graves Creek Road. The petition was signed by 10 freeholders of the road district. A notice of hearing has been published twice in the Missoulian and all affected landowners have been contacted. It's now pre presented to you for your discussion and to set a date for the road viewing and second hearing. And I believe Steve has some more information as well. Uh, I guess I can just add that are you still seeing my screen and the cursor? Yep. Okay, the cursor is showing where the original 1900s era um, petitioned roadway is currently. The black line, which is what is constructed and used today as Greaves Creek Road, has no recorded right of way. It's just by use. As is the case in so many of these instances, there's an old road, um, a new location is chosen to build an improved road, and the legal right-of-way is not changed to the new road location. This is exactly what's going on here. North of this blue line, the petition road has already been altered by petition to the constructed and traveled road. So altering this portion over to the constructed road makes perfect sense. Um, in the review of the preliminary survey, I, I noticed this and I said, hey, why don't you petition to move this? And they said, yeah, good idea. So that's where we are. Um, I will make myself available for any date for road viewing. And we can, um, I guess, maybe take separate cars if that's desirable, or I guess we could both wear masks. 
<laughs> and how? Whose turn is it? Do I go? I think I think Shane and I did the last one. So, have you done one, Juan? I did the ones in the Blackfoot. Um, so maybe it maybe it's my turn to go out. Could be yours. Sure. Yeah. You can go look for somewhere else if you well, can. Well, I'm, I'm hoping uh, COVID-19 passes soon so the jack might be open when I'm out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll go whenever uh, I'll go whenever we're able to schedule it through Sarah. Great. Okay. Sounds like we're pretty solid there. Sam, are you good with all that? Um, yeah, as long as we can set a date for the second hearing. Okay, let's let's do that. Is that Amy? Do you, Amy, do you want to chime in on a on a second date? Yep, um, we could do May seventh or um, the. Let me look up the other date in May. Sorry. So we could do May 7th or um, May 28th. Doesn't matter to me. I, I think we can shoehorn it in for either one. Uh, okay. Steve, could you do it before May 7th, the viewing? Sure. Yeah, you bet. Okay. I'll okay. do it then. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Emmy. Hey, Josh. Thanks, Steve. Yes, sir. I got a couple of things. Um, first, I I just want the record to reflect that even though Steve Nide is a is a, an excellent surveyor, seeing him there on the screen, I, I think that in his <laughs> next life he should be an air traffic controller. <laughs> so, Let the record reflect that. <laughs> the headphones were a good look. <laughs> Um, and just just in case there's anybody who has any public comment on this, I don't I don't think you you, you asked for any public comment. Oh, thank you. Was anyone out there like to speak to the Graves Creek Road petition? Okay, let's let's move to our next public hearing. This is about the Missoula Rural Fire District petition, and Sam Scott is still on deck. Still here. Um, yes, yeah, so the clerk and recorder has received seven petitions to annex land into the Missoula Rural Fire District. Without objection, I won't read all the legal descriptions and addresses, but I can if anybody would like. Um, they have been included via the notice of hearing and RCA, so they're part of the pet, uh, petition packet. Petitions. You know, what's the general area? Or um, One is on Graves Creek Road, or a few are on Graves Creek Road, Deer Creek Road. Lolo Creek Drive and Wilderness Trail. So kind of all over, it seems to be the petitions they've gotten over the last few months. Got it, okay. Sa Sam, this is Dave. Could you uh, refresh my memory? It seems like a while back we uh, uh, changed our process in a way that would uh, allow consolidation of these in some sense so that to reduce costs. Uh, could you just remind me what that what that is? Yeah, so um, we used to do these one by one. Essentially, the fire districts would send them in with every um, every time that a property submitted a or filled out a petition, and they did a site visit and all that sort of stuff. Um, we now, because it really, um, as it affects the taxes, it only has to be, you know, they have to happen by a certain point every year. And so it doesn't matter if we get one or if we get eight in a row, eight at once. And so that's what we've chosen to do so that we can combine all those notices of hearing, all that, all the mailings, that sort of thing. Um, it's much more efficient for us and for the fire districts. Got it. Okay, I will move that we approve the, uh, well, uh, maybe I should wait. Are, uh, is there public comment? Josh? Yeah, we should ask for, for anyone have anything to say about this? Any public comment out there on Missoula, Missoula Rural Fire District petitions. All right. Oh, good. oh, was that someone chiming Can in? Speak, yep, up there. 
Yeah, I was somebody saying that as long as it gets approved, we're good. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, with with that uh, ring of endorsement, I'll move that we approve the seven uh, rural fire district petitions. Second, and I guess, do we need to record your name, sir, for our 381 yeah. 2056? We should get it. We should get a name and a spelling on that name for, for the record. Yeah, it's for 7850 Graves Creek. And yes. It's Matt. It's Matt Clary. Matt Clary. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. And yeah, I'm, I'm Ann True oh, yeah. on Deer Creek. <clears throat> Say that again, Anne. Anne True, A N N E T R U E, and I'm on the Deer Creek, 3368 Deer Creek. Okay, thank you. Would you like to add something to this discussion? No, I think I'm good. I'm just trying to really understand what what you guys are doing. I don't. It, the letter didn't really say too much. Sam, do you, would you mind offering Ms. True a bit of an explanation about how things may be different now? Um, yeah, and, and John may want to um, take over if, he, <laughs> if he'd like. Um, but ultimately, these are just being officially annexed into the rural fire district so that they'll be assessed appropriately um, on the tax bills. Um, the fire district obviously has a, consented and approved to um, their coverage of these properties in the event of wildfire. Um, and so this is just the formalization of that and um, assessing the properties as such. So Sam, can can you maybe just walk through what that means? Like, so there's a fire on, say, exactly. Anne's property. What, what happens? happens? Yeah, that's a good way to phrase it. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, actually, our, I don't want to speak too much for exactly how the rural fire district handles that. Um, there might, maybe John would be better suited to that. Um, my assumption is that They'll, you know, recognize it as a property that they they cover, and they will, um, they'll protect it. I don't, I don't know too that's, much. That's, that's my understanding. If they're in the district, and they're called, then they come. Yep. Well, and, and Sam, is it not the case that uh, these prop properties that we're contemplating uh, uh, approving to be included within the districts, the property owners petitioned to have their properties. Correct. So, so. We're, we're not uh, imposing upon these property owners anything that they have not requested. No, every petition was signed and approved by the landowner themselves. Um, and then it was submitted to the fire district and they go through their uh, kind of a checklist inspection to make sure it, it is something that they can protect and that they're, they're willing to and that they all agree that it should be. Um, and so the no notice that we sent out was just the notice of hearing saying that it was being presented to you for the final say, final decision on whether or not it would be included in the district. Thanks. Yeah, this, as an act of government, I really like this one and that people are asking for something and at the same time asking to be assessed to pay for it. So it's, it's all out there all at once. With that, I think we can entertain a motion. Yeah, I would move that we approve the seven uh, uh, petitions. Uh, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I believe the uh, Pine Drive Road petition has been put off till a later date. So uh, do we have any other business? Uh, a subdivision. Well, subdivision. <laughs> Oh, geez, it's not. No. <laughs> I thought I wrote it all down. Good catch. Which what? what let's let's bring it up. Hey, hey Josh. Guys. Josh, uh, uh, any thoughts on when we might reschedule Pine Drive? Uh, is it May seventh? Is the next uh, public hearing? Is that what I understand? Yes, May seventh is. Do we have do we have time for that one on May seventh, Emmy? I think we should. Yeah. Okay. Was someone trying to say something earlier? Yes, yeah, sorry. I was. Um, I just was muted during the the road move. Um, is there a way we can be on that viewing as well, since we live right on that road? It, it would directly affect us if it got moved. Uh, yeah, I think the pu these are public meetings, so the public would be uh, uh, welcome to join us on the road viewing. 
And how 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 did they get contacted? Maybe Steve can chime in. Yeah, um, just provide a phone number or an email address, and as soon as we schedule a time and date, I will get in contact with you and tell you where and when to meet. Okay, perfect. Uh, do you want me to give that now? or? Yes, go ahead. Okay, okay it's 406-406. Uh, 381-2081. Okay, 406-381-2081. Yes, sir, thanks. Yep, I'll give you a call. Thanks. So are we looking for Matt Heimel out there? Hello. I'm Matt Clary, C-L-A-R-Y. Hello, Matt. You can introduce this next one. Okay, I'll uh, share my screen for jumping in. Oh, no. I'm sorry, that is the wrong one. It went so smoothly on Monday. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Matt Heimel with CAPS. And I'll be presenting the staff report for Golden West Number One Lot 12 subdivision. This subdivision is located at 1555 Hayes Drive. It's a proposed two lot minor subdivision. The applicant is Flagship Investment Properties LLC and it's represented by WGM Group Incorporated. Uh, here's an aerial image of the property. Uh, the, the lots uh, developed with an existing single family dwelling unit and the upper portion is proposed to be developed with another single family dwelling unit uh, with completion of the subdivision. Both lots will use individual wells for water supply and there's one additional connection to city sewer proposed for the new lot. Here's a aerial image showing the uh, vicinity and then on the right side of the screen you can see the proposed subdivision conditions. Uh, so the subject property is a 2.54 acre parcel that was originally uh, created with the Golden West edition in 1975. The north part of the lot has remained vacant ever since with the exception of a few accessory structures that, that are located there. And the area is generally located south of Mullen Road and east of Coat Lane. So primary access for the two lots will be via individual approaches onto Hayes Drive. And Hayes Drive is a county maintained right of way. This subdivision is outside of the floodplain. Uh, it's outside of any other significant hazard areas. There's no slope over 25%. It's primarily a flat area and the vegetation consists of mainly grasses and mature planted trees. So moving on to zoning, the property is zoned CRR1 residential with a maximum density of one dwelling unit per acre. And the proposed subdivision does comply with the, with the existing zoning. The adjacent properties share the same zoning designation and also in the surrounding areas you can see on the zoning exhibit, there, is some, there are other uh, residential zoning districts in the area. So moving on to land use, the 2019 Missoula area land use element designates this location as residential with a recommended density ranging from three to 11 dwelling units per acre. And the proposed uh, subdivision, it, it does not exceed the recommended density. So it, it's in, in line with generally complying with the growth policy. I'm going to go back a couple to my proposed conditions. Looks like I skipped over a couple of notes on the proposed lots. Uh, so. The south part on the proposed conditions, that will that's the existing area with the existing house. That will be lot 12A, and that will be one acre in area. And the northern part of the lot will be new lot 12B, and that's that will be 1.54 acres in area. So this is a image of the preliminary plat for the subdivision. Uh, if at any time anyone wants me to go back to this, I can zoom in, go into more, more detail. So from here, I'm going to touch on the conclusions of law for each of the subdivision review criteria, and then I'll touch on the conditions of approval for the subdivision. So moving into conclusions, 
the first criteria we'll look at is zoning and growth policy compliance. And um, the subdivision, as I said earlier, complies with the CR1 zoning and it's in substantial compliance with the Missoula area land use element and the Missoula County growth policy. Went into one of the review criteria effects on agriculture and agricultural water user facilities. Uh, we conclude that there's no impacts to existing agriculture or agricultural water user for uh, water user facilities. And this mainly coming from that the subdivision won't be displacing or disrupting any agricultural operations. It's in line with the uh, agricultural land section of the Missoula County subdivision regulations, which generally has an intent to balance the interests, needs and patterns between agricultural lands and transitioning land uses for and also for preserving an existing and uh, existing neighborhoods for enhancing existing neighborhoods and the residential land use designation in the in the growth policy does provide for compatible infill housing, which this subdivision would provide. Moving on to effects on local services. There's a few criteria here, which I'll touch on um, a few at a time. Uh, regarding roads and pedestrian facilities, the proposal complies with Missoula County subdivision regulations. There actually are no new roads. There are no new pedestrian facilities proposed. And although the subdivision is technically located within the urban area, it does fall under the exceptions for those urban standards because uh, there's no new facilities and it's only two lots. And then for water and sanitation systems, uh, as I said, there'll be individual wells and a new sewer connection and uh, review of water and sanitation system is, is under the jurisdiction of state and local health authorities under the uh, Sanitation and Subdivisions Act. Moving on to uh, effects on local services. So for solid waste, um, we found that solid waste service will, will be available uh, based on um, information provided by, by the applicant. And this is a minor subdivision, so it's exempt from parkland dedication or cash in lieu of parkland dedication. And there are no identified um, impacts to schools that would require additional mitigation. Uh, for review with uh, local services through the fire department. So this subdivision will meet fire protection requirements of the subdivision regulations with conditions of approval. The proposal is for the installation of residential fire sprinklers in any new uh, structures, and uh, those plans will need to be reviewed and approved before any zoning compliance permit is issued for a new house. And this is in with, within a uh, Missoula Rural Fire District. And there will be a second uh, condition of approval for fire, requiring um, some language about fire turnarounds in the in the covenants. And I'll go, go over that more once I touch on the covenants. And also the subdivision has been reviewed for adequate police protection for the Missoula County subdivision regulations. So now moving on into effects on the natural environment and wildlife and wildlife habitat, we conclude that the subdivision complies with the uh, Missoula County subdivision regulations and mitigates impacts to natural environment, wildlife and wildlife habitat. And this is mainly based on uh, three aspects. One, there will be living with wildlife recommendations included in the covenants. And then two and three, there will be a revegetation plan and weed management plan filed with the subdivision. Into effects on public health and safety, uh, there's no floodplain, no steep slopes, uh, no groundwater issues. Um, no uh, significant impacts to, to air quality. There is a note in the covenants about uh, just a cautionary note about radon. And then moving on to uh, general compliance, we review compliance with survey requirements, subdivision regulations, of course, and then review procedures. And this um, subdivision uh, meets requirements on all three fronts. And we look at the provision for uh, providing utility easements, legal and physical access, and both uh, utility easements will be available with the subdivision. We will have notes on the plat uh, referring to those. And also there, the subdivision proposal meets physical and legal access requirements. So now I'll move into the conditions of approval, of which there are six. So the first condition is touching on a uh, existing accessory structure on proposed lot B. And essentially what we're saying is that if, if the structure that is proposed to be removed is not removed before the final plat, uh, demonstrate zoning compliance 
that might be through a, uh, for example, a um, non-conforming zoning de determination, or just to simply remove the structure prior to filing uh, for final plat. And we have some con uh, two conditions for plat notes. Like I said earlier, we'll have re our requirements for utility easement language and also waivers of right to protest the creation of rural special improvement districts or special improvement districts for uh, maintenance of infrastructure that serves the subdivision. And I'll note that there are no proposed districts at this time right there. And also for roads, there are required contributions to the transportation system funds for signalizing the Flynn Mullen Road intersection and improving the reserve street and Mullen Road intersections. And then this is the first of two uh, conditions of approval relating to fire. So as I mentioned earlier, earlier we have required fire sprinklers and this uh, language you see here will be required to be placed on, on the plat. So any new uh, structures will need the uh, sprinklers reviewed by the fire district and by zoning compliance permit approval. And then this is the second uh, condition of approval. And this is to make sure that the covenants include uh, really the correct specific language that the county uses for uh, specifying driveway turnarounds in case a new driveway exceeds 150 feet in length. That concludes my presentation on the Golden West number one lot 12 subdivision staff report. Staff recommends approval of the subdivision subject to conditions and there is a uh, draft motion available on the screen. And I'm available for any questions and I believe we have a representative with WGM here on the call today too. Jamie, are you out there? Yeah, hi Josh. Hey. Um, I don't have anything else to add. I do just want to say thank you uh, for doing these virtual hearings. I know that some of the other communities and counties in Missoula or um, outside of Missoula are still working through the, the details of virtual hearings. So I appreciate the commissioners and staff to um, be able to do this. It's been great. If you have they any questions, they, me, feel free. They, they don't have any. That's the deal. Yeah. <laughs> do this. I, I bet that's true. <laughs> it's true. I'm just, it's so refreshing to see a subdivision proposal that uh, complies with um, everything. With everything. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, I make a motion to approve uh, Golden West edition number one. Oh, I, I don't have the correct language anymore, Matt. Oh, is there any public comment, Josh? Oh, sorry. Just, yeah. Any, anybody like to speak to this? Okay. okay. Seeing none. Let's plow ahead. I move that the Golden West number one lot 12 subdivision be approved based on the findings of fact and conclusion of law in the staff report and subject to the recommended conditions of approval in the staff report. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So it's done. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Emmy. The dogs love it too. The dogs love it Thank too. You. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you, Matt. Bye. Thank you. So with with that, I think we unless there is any other business. Um, there's a I got an email that uh, Governor Bullock has a 3:30 press call. Yes. If anyone. Yeah. Good, good, good to put that out there, Juan. Do you have Do you have any contact any available info right there? We could tell people how to get to it. Oh, Emmy might because that's a uh, Facebook Live through the um what uh, forgetting the outfit the information center um oh boy it's all right i thought if you were staring at it i'm not staring at it but maybe i looks like dave is on it uh, gotta... i'm looking for it uh oh hang on it's at my fingertips here um yes uh facebook live for this is through the montana public affairs network facebook page so uh, if you're in Facebook, just search for Montana Public Affairs Network, and that should bring you to uh, the governor's live press conference. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks. And I guess I, I would just add, uh, it, it's uh, maybe seeming a little like kicking a dead horse, but it's an important message that folks ought to keep social distancing. Uh, uh, it's, it's the one of 
one of the things that we have within our control to try to uh, nip this COVID-19 in the bud. So please keep your distance from others. Thanks. Thank you for that. All right. Then if we have no other business, we will call it a day for April 9th. There you well, go. Done. Did it on time. Oh, nice. Yeah.